Okay, hello class. Welcome to 5.3 Collisions. Okay, exciting stuff. Now, we've got two type of collisions that we're going to talk about. The first one is elastic collisions. And we're going to talk about perfectly elastic collisions. So first off, an elastic collision is a collision where momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. And we'll see on the second page that this contrasts with inelastic collisions where kinetic energy is not conserved. Um, and that's possible. Okay, now there's a special type of elastic collision called a perfectly elastic collision, which is sort of the ideal um, collision with no external forces. And this makes all the conservation perfect. It means that all the momentum is perfectly conserved, all the kinetic energy is perfectly conserved. So this is our, our perfect physics problem, and it's not really real life, but that's okay. That's what we work with. Now, for this sort of collision, we've said momentum and kinetic energy in, are conserved. So we have two useful equations. We've got our momentum. So I can say the initial momentum, um, pi1 plus pi2, uh, oops, is equal to, oh no, pi1 plus pi2 is equal to pf1 plus PF2. So if I take my two initial momentums and add them, they equal my two final momentums. So that's one of our equations that we'll use. And the other one is that kinetic energy is conserved. So EK1, oops, EKI1 plus EKI2. So our initial kinetic energies equal our final kinetic energies. Okay, so those are our two useful equations in this situation. And we've got a problem here. Well, I'll, I'll show you just to the right here. There's this picture. We've got two balls heading towards each other at some speed. They hit each other, and they bounce back in opposite directions. So this is our sort of perfectly elastic collision, where they just bounce back and keep on their merry way. And um, we're dealing just in one dimension. So you can see that it's just in a straight line right now. Okay, so we have a problem here. It says, suppose you have two balls with different masses involved in a perfectly elastic collision. Ball 1 with mass m1 is 0 0.26 kilograms, traveling at a velocity of uh, v1, collides head-on with stationary ball 2, which has a mass of m2. Determine the final velocities of both balls after the collision. So we've got one ball coming towards the other. The other one is just standing still. Okay, now this seems like it should be doable, and it is, but I'm going to say right now, this problem, this problem is way too much work. Way too much work. And... 5.4, our next uh, section, gives us a much easier way, a much easier way to solve these. So, I'm going to say you don't need to solve something like this ever. So, you don't need to do this. If you want, in the video, you can just skip ahead over this problem. You don't need to do this. And I'm not even going to do the whole thing. I'm going to sort of do parts and then wave my hands a bit and go to the end. Um, it's really, it's just kind of silly because in 5.4, we get some nice equations that do this much easier. Okay, but without those nice equations, we'll take a look at how we would approach this problem just knowing what we know, that momentum and energy are conserved. So first off, we can say momentum. Well, we've got our momentum 
is conserved. So we can say that m1 vi1 plus m2 vi2 is equal to m1 vf1 plus m2 vf2. Okay, clear enough. Now we said that the first, uh, that the second mass starts at zero. It's not moving at all. So we can cross this guy out. That's good. That's at zero. So this cleans our equation up a bit. And now we can rearrange this guy. And let's just solve for vf1, because we want to know the final speed of both of these guys. So let's just choose the first ball first. So vf1, I'll solve for this, is going to equal well, we've got from the left side here, m1, vi1, whoops, vi1, hang on, m1, vi1, good. And then we'll move over the m2, vf2 from the right side, and then divide by m1. Okay, and now you'll notice that this can simplify a bit, so I'll do that. This equals... Well, the vi1, the m1 on there just disappears. And then we still have m2 over m1 times vf2. Okay, now that's pretty good. We're just going to actually put in our numbers right away now. Because um, we have vi1, we have vf2, uh, we don't have vf2, sorry. But we have mass 2 and mass 1. So this gives us um, 1.3 meters per second minus um, 0 0.58 times VF2. Okay, so this is sort of a useful statement here. VF1 is equal to this. And that's as far as we get just using momentum. Now we need to use kinetic energy. And we say that kinetic energy is conserved. Well, that means that 1 half MVI1 squared plus 1 half MV i2 squared is equal to 1 half mv f1 squared plus 1 half mv f2 squared. Okay, there's our kinetic energy statement. Okay, once again, vi2 was equal to zero, so that just disappears. And what we can do is we would substitute in our vf1 from above. That's what we would do, and that's this is where I, I say I'm just going to wave my hands a bit. We would stick that in uh, to where it says vf1 in our equation. We would go ahead and rearrange and simplify a whole bunch until we get a final sort of equation that would look like 0 equals negative 0 0.39 vf2 plus 0 0.24 VF2 squared. And this is a nice, clean statement that just has VF2. So we can find VF2 now. Um, first thing we want to do is maybe factor out our VF2. So we get negative 0 0.39 plus 0 0.24 VF2 in here. So that means that VF2 is either equal to zero, well, that's just if, if they don't end up hitting each other at all. Then the, the second one will just still stay equal to zero. Um, we don't really care about that situation. We want the other situation where VF2 is equal to, in this case, 0 0.39 over 0 0.24, which is equal to 1.63 meters per second. And there is our, our VF2. And then we can put that back into our equation for VF1 from up above, which was 1.3 meters per second minus 0 0.58 VF2. Good. And this just um, becomes this. Stick in our 1.63. And it gives us a value of 0 0.35 meters per second. And there you go. So that's how we could solve this whole problem, just using very basic conservation of momentum and conservation of kinetic energy. Now, like I promised, 
in 3.4, we're going to see a much easier way of doing that. And we're already at 10 minutes. You see how long that took. Hopefully you just skipped right over this. All right. Page 2. Perfectly inelastic collisions in one dimension. Now this one we're not skipping over. This is, this is actually a lot easier to do, even though I think that's a bit surprising. You'd think the elastic collisions would make more sense. Okay, inelastic collisions. This is a collision where momentum is conserved, just like in the other problem. Momentum is conserved, but now kinetic energy is not. And there's a picture to the right here of an example where one car rear ends the other and they become what's called sort of bumper locked, where they end up sort of connected together, which means that if if they're moving forwards, they have to move forwards at the same speed. They sort of become, it's like the opposite of an explosion, where they end up joining each other. So in a perfectly inelastic collision, this is our ideal, um, ideal collision where two objects stick together. Two objects stick together. And they have the same final velocity, Vf. This is our perfectly inelastic collision, which we're going to look at. And we have an equation for this situation where there's just the one Vf, right? They share the same uh, final speed. And we can say that Vf is equal to m1 Vi1 plus m2 vi2 all over m1 plus m2. And your textbook has a nice derivation for that, but we're just going to use it as is. That'll be on your formula sheet, of course. So we've got two problems that use this. The first one says a large car of mass 2,500 kilograms and a small car of mass 1,200 kilograms are coasting at constant velocities along a straight road. The small car is moving at 10 meters per second west, and the large car is behind it moving at 40 meters per second west, catching up to it. When they collide, because the large car just decides to drive right into the back of the other car, when they collide, the cars lock bumpers. Now we want to determine the velocity of the cars just after the collision. So this is just a matter of using this nice equation. We have Vf is equal to m1 Vi1 plus m2 Vi2 put vector arrows on those, and we've got over m1 plus m2. Okay, and now we just get to put in some numbers. m1 was 2,500. The big car was moving at 40 meters per second, plus 1,200 times 10, all over 2,500, plus 1,200. And this gives us a nice 30.3 meters per second west. See? See how much quicker that was than the first page? Wow. Okay. We've got another problem that uses this equation. It says a child with a mass of 22 kilograms runs at a horizontal velocity of 4.2 meters per second forward and then jumps onto a stationary rope swing of mass 2.6 kilograms. The child sticks on the rope swing and swings forward. Okay, so this is a rope that's hanging down. And the, the kid runs up to it, grabs onto the rope. Usually you do this sort of at a, a river or something. He'll grab onto it and swing out into the river, uh, sort of jump off at the end uh, into the river. Okay, if you've seen like Jungle Book or something like that, it's the same sort of thing. So we want to determine the horizontal velocity of the child plus the swing just after impact, just after they, they connect. So I'll draw a little picture here of what's going on, a system diagram. So we've got our, our runner here, our little kid, 22 kilograms, and he's running at a speed of 4.2 meters per second. And over here is this rope. It has a mass of 2.6 kilograms, 
and what's going to happen is the rope is going to sort of swing up like this a bit. So they're going to have some sort of combined speed immediately when, when, the, when the kid grabs it. We use our equation, and it's just m1 vi1 plus m2 vi2 over m1 plus m2, and we'll stick in some numbers here, 22 times 42 plus, and now the rope doesn't have an initial speed, so we just get to make that zero, which is nice. And then all divided by 22 plus 2.6 for the total mass. This gives us 3.76 meters per second forward. And do make sure whenever you're using a vector symbol for your, f for your um, variable, that you're giving some sort of direction on the, the final value. So here we're saying forward. Okay, how high do the child and the swing rise? Well, this is just actually combining what we know now, they've got some initial speed, um, with our conservation of kinetic energy. Now remember, the collision doesn't involve kinetic energy being conserved. The kid, when he's running at it, some kinetic energy is lost when, they, when he grabs the rope. That's okay, but once he grabs the rope, now we're saying they have this speed of 3.76, and then they're going to swing up. And now it's just become a conservation of energy problem where we're converting kinetic into, into gravitational potential. So we can say E k is equal to delta E g. Good. And so we've got our statement for E k. That's 1 half m v. I'm going to use our v f, which we calculated above. m v f squared is equal to, oh, and I will say that our mass here is the combined mass. So I should say one-half times m1 plus m2. It's the mass of the child and the swing, vf squared, is equal to m1 plus m2 g delta y. Okay, and now we just want to solve for delta y. So we can say delta y is equal to vf squared, well, because this crosses out, this crosses out, so we get vf squared over 2g. Quite simple. So this gives a 3.76 squared over 2 times 9.8 for a final value of 0 0.72 meters. That's how high they rise. And that's it. That's the whole lesson. Um, if you skipped over page one, then great. It would have been nice and quick. See you in the next one.